Um, my name is Craig Miller. I was here last year. It was my our first time doing this. Um, I'm with Circa, as you can see. We uh, we just launched a new advertising campaign that I'm sure everybody has been able to see over the last couple months. Um, we advertise in nationally uh, uh, broadcast or na you know national uh, magazines and. Town & Country is one, uh, Harper's Bazaar, we're in uh, uh, New York Times, and we do a lot of advertising, but also to the trade. What we do is simple. We're the largest global buyer of diamonds and jewelry from the public. Uh, we have 10 offices globally. Our uh, main office is in New York City. We have an office here in Chicago. We have an office in Palm Beach, uh, an office in um, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., we're going to be opening soon in LA. We have an office uh, opening soon in Las Vegas. We also have an office in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we just opened up Barcelona, and we're going to be opening up in uh, Milan very soon and Geneva as well. So we're, we're expanding our footprint. But in the most efficient way for us to expand our footprint in the US is to work with jewelers who either A, buy from the public, or B, do not buy from the public. And uh, so my job is, is to be the liaison between Circa and the retailers of the United States. And I believe there's 27,000 retailers, and uh, um, everybody could find a need for our service one way or the other. Um, so we're the only luxury branded buying firm on the buy side. We wanted to create something. Before Circa existed, there was outlets for you to sell your jewelry. You could go to your local jeweler, which everybody here buys. You, uh, you could go to auction. You could go to a pawn shop. Uh, or you could try and find the end user. It was very difficult. But we decided to position ourselves as a luxury buying, buying firm. And what that means is, is that anybody who comes to us, comes to one of our offices, uh, will be treated in a very professional manner. Um, that we have a nice atmosphere in which to do business. And uh, we're going to make offers as much as we possibly can, or as high as we possibly can. We really want to pay as much as we possibly can. Um, so we uh, started in 2001. We have uh, 12 years under our belt now. The last three years have been pivotal for us, not because the economy turned, but because our uh, we've kind of our growth spurt has come over the last three years due to advertising and because we're opening more offices. So our, our profile is much higher now than it's ever been, and for good reason. Um, we work with retailers across the country now. We have a couple different programs. Our first program is is that we we offer a purchasing agent program, and that is if you don't buy at all from the public we can provide full service estate buying for your company. And uh, what we do is we, and we have 25 of these so far, uh, some of the better known jewelers that we work with, Underwoods in, in Jacksonville, uh, Bromberg's in, in, uh, uh, in Alabama, we work with Wilson & Son in Scarsdale. And most of the stores that we work with, we have 25 partners, but most of the stores that we work with, we vet out uh, to make sure that they're of the caliber that we would want to do business with usually a Rolex dealer or high branded uh, type of a, a jewelry store with high integrity. And we go in and we send a letter to the database and we uh, uh, let them know that they have a new dynamic service that they provide to the public that they can come in and drop their jewelry off and send it to Circa for, a, for an offer. And we actually speak to the clients ourselves uh, to make the offer so you're at arm's length, which is an important part of the process. Um, because we're going to be the bad guy if they're not happy with the offer, not you. But um, we uh, also then will come to your store once or twice a year and provide a buying event, a two-day buying event, which has been extremely successful for us. And the reason is, is because of the reputation of the jeweler in the marketplace and because of our reputation. So we provide full service. If you're not, uh, if you do buy from the public and we can still be of help to you, we can provide a platform for you for which to sell you the items that you don't want to sell in your own case. So let's say somebody comes in, sells you an important bracelet, but it's a high profile piece and this is a high profile client and you don't want to put it back into your case because they're going to see it, um, then you could sell it to us and we'll move it because we have a global reach. In other words, 
if it's something that's not item specific or market specific that will sell well in your market, it might sell well in a, a foreign market or another type of market. And that's why we're able to buy everything because we've developed the whole uh, uh, global network. And there isn't anything we don't buy. We're obviously not a gold buyer, but it's part of our service. We do provide uh, service to customers who come to us off the street, but I don't buy gold from jewelers because you can work with refiners uh, before I would be able to help you. All right, so if you do buy from the public, what's important is to recognize certain hallmarks. You know, some of the mistakes that, that have been made over the last, and then we can use the last three years as an example. A lot of people have turned to buying to supplement their, their lack of sales, which is great. People are doing it to survive. I'm all about that. Um, but you can easily upset a client if somebody comes in with a piece of jewelry that you can't recognize as something that's, that's special. Or, for instance, um, there was a bracelet that I bought about a year ago that was a 1950s yellow gold bracelet. It, it, all it was was yellow gold. There was no diamonds, no gemstones. But I recognized it, and on the, uh, on the tongue it had a, uh, an eagle's head, which is a European or French hallmark. And so I was able to pay about 30% more than the scrap value for this piece, which was great because the client uh, had shopped it around to several people and people were trying to buy it as gold or 30% or 40% below the gold price. So you can imagine the difference between what I paid for her and what the offers were on the street. So she in immediately had confidence in our, in our service because of that, because she knows that we recognize this piece as a very important piece of jewelry. Um, signatures are also very important because I've, I've come across things that come over the counter that, uh, s that somebody has bought as a piece of Cartier from the 60s or 70s, but it has a plaque on it instead of a hand engraved Cartier signature, so in fact it's not Cartier. So you might be buying something over the counter that looks like it's a Cartier piece, but in fact it, somebody has actually put a plaque on it. So it's very important to be able to distinguish between the, uh, the signatures, especially with older merchandise with Van Cleef, Cartier, Tiffany. And Tiffany has a lot of different signatures that are, you know, so it's important to know. Um, period pieces, we'll talk a bit, little bit about that today. What's a period piece? I'm sure a lot of you have seen a lot of jewelry that's old, 100 years plus old, that doesn't seem to be wearable today. And there's not a market for it, but in fact there is a market for certain old pieces. There's a couple of uh, companies that are, uh, there's Marshak, there's, uh, there's a company out of San Francisco, uh, the name escapes me, um, but there's a couple of pieces that we've bought over the years that were very important. They were made out of black steel and pearls, but yet the, the, the provenance of the piece, or the pedigree I should say of the piece, was important because it was collectible and we were able to pay enough for it that the, the client understood that we do know what we're doing. And uh, um, we were, you know, for instance, uh, it was a pair of earrings that we paid 2,500 for. They were black steel and pearls. So most people wouldn't have known what to pay. Um, iconic jewelry is just really more about, um, Cartier has a love bracelet, that's iconic. Uh, Van Cleef has an Alhambra necklace, that's very iconic. These are items that we look for. There's much more demand for iconic jewelry so you can pay more of a premium for it than you can for, you know, Cartier's made a lot of things over the years, and not everything was beautiful. <laughs> so, you, you, don't, you know, sometimes I'll stretch just because it says Cartier, but I have to look at it and think, well, is this something that's really sellable and usable today? And, uh, well, just this last week, I did buy a, a bunch of Cartier spoons. They were 14 karat gold, they were, uh, they were teaspoons, and uh, we did pay a premium of about 10% uh, over the scrap value. So there are certain things that still will sell, but a Cartier compact that doesn't have any jewels on it or is just gold might be just for the gold value or a little bit thereof. You know, don't go crazy thinking, well, since it's signed Cartier that I could pay a huge premium for this um, because sometimes you can. You have to think about practicality of some of these items today, like lighters, Cartier lighters. They're really not worth as much as you might think. You'll get something in, it might be 40 penny weight, but in fact, it's only 10 penny weights of gold. And, and who's using a lighter today? So there's certain things you have to be careful of. Jewelry versus gold, when to scrap it and when to buy it for a premium, and the genuine article, and we've talked a little bit about that already. So let's start with hallmarks. 
Um, as you can see here, the, the wolf head, this is on a, a Cartier watch. This is clearly a French hallmark. So anytime you have a French hallmark on something, generally, even if it's just gold, it's going to be valued more than just the gold itself. It's a very important hallmark to spot. Also, if you see watches or any pieces that say that have a Cartier signature but doesn't have the, the hallmark, it might not be the genuine article. So you've got to be very careful of that. This is a, a classic Bulgari style uh, earring, something that Bulgari made very famous in the 80s. On the back, it tells you exactly what the coins are, and this is what's important to look for uh, when you're buying Bulgari pieces because without these marks, it's possible that you could make a mistake again. Signatures are also very important. You'll see them, this, if I could blow it up, I would, but you see it says Cartier here. There's a specific way that they sign their pieces of jewelry, and there's a specific, um, the R is also very specific, and sometimes I've seen it signed differently, and that's when I know it's not the genuine article, and you've got to be very careful because uh, there's a lot of people out there that have signed things uh, that aren't the actual that weren't originally made in the workshops of Paris. So that's something we like to talk about, too. Uh, here's another one. This is Boucheron Paris, which is a very important signature. Boucheron is known, uh, they're still a modern jeweler, but they're known for older pieces that are very finely made. Pave, especially in, in Europe and in France, is, is some of the best pave in the world. And so they have, there's a lot of extra value to a, a piece that would be Boucheron Paris versus a piece that was made in the United States or in South America. Much bigger difference. Now we'll go to period pieces, because I know that if you're buying over the counter, you've seen a lot of this over the last three years. <laughs> and it's being passed down from generation to generation to generation. And people uh, uh, don't want it. They don't have a, a connection to it. If it's a couple people removed, like this was my great, great grandma, uh, there might not be some um, emotional attachment to it or sentimental attachment. So they'll bring it to you and you'll try and buy it for gold, and most of the times you will, and you might even scrap some of this, um, which is not unusual. But some of these items, because if they're in very good condition and are not dented, not scratched, can be worth more than just the gold value. And, uh, and, and some of them were just pedestrian during the time, and there's a lot of it in the marketplace. Like, for instance, uh, cameos. There's only very few rare cameos in the marketplace that are worth more than gold. There's a lot of cameos in the marketplace that are only worth gold, but there's very few of them that are worth more than the gold value. Uh, this is the Renaissance Revival period, so I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. You have to know, be, be able to tell the difference between what uh, uh, the actual original pieces are and what modern versions of these are today. This is Edwardian. So you can see the front and the back, and that's usually a good telltale sign, too, of a fine piece of jewelry. If the back is finished as well as the front, uh, it's, it's usually a, a better piece of jewelry. If, there's, if you can see the punch-out work and it's not very fine, then you know it could be made in South America. Big difference between the two in value. Um, here's a, an Art Nouveau piece, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of, too, if you buy from the public. Um, recently, I, I had one that came in, and they're usually about this big, and it was signed Kremitz. And if everybody knows Kremitz, they, they made a lot of costume jewelry or fashion jewelry, but they also made fine jewelry, too. And this piece was literally this big, and if I waited, it was like two penny weight, maybe, and it would have melted for maybe $90 or $100 uh, at that much. And I actually ended up paying $800 for it. They were happy, and we got a profit. So it's still tradable. And of course, Art Deco, which there's a lot of Art Deco jewelry out there, but there's a lot of faux Art Deco. <laughs> and, and that's where you have to be very careful. Um, we buy a lot of Art Deco uh, pieces. Obviously, Cartier and Yard are one of the best uh, names in Art Deco jewelry. And these are clips. Together, they're worth a lot more than individually. So if somebody came to you with one clip versus two, uh, it wouldn't be worth as much as we would pay for both the clips very important to, re to remember, too. And anything with the carved rubies and emeralds is going to be worth even more. This Cartier made uh, in, the, in the 30s what was called Tutti Frutti. It's probably the most collectible Art Deco jewelry out there. Retro. Uh, pink gold was a big part of the retro period, 1940s. So you might see bracelets that come in that have pink gold and yellow gold together. Uh, you can buy it for less than scrap, but if they know what they're doing, you 
you can pay a premium for it, which we did for these two bracelets that we bought at a, a buying event uh, one weekend, and we paid more than the scrap value. They were happy, we were happy, and because we made a profit. So it's very important, you know, this didn't have a signature or a hallmark or anything. It was just a 1940s retro, fine example of retro. And now onto the iconic jewelry, which I was talking about earlier. These necklaces now sell for $7,400 retail. So if somebody was to come in and it was a real VCA necklace, we would pay $3,000 for this necklace and maybe more if we had to. But there's a lot of these in the marketplace that are fakes, too. So you've got to be very careful to be able to spot the difference between a fake and the real Van Cleef article. But um, this is 10 motifs, and it's mother of pearl. It's 7400 retail right now. This, of course, is Cartier. The panther dates back uh, to Jean Toussaint, who was a uh, uh, designer with Cartier uh, back in the 20s. Um, it's very iconic for Cartier, any image with the panther. A lot of jewelry uh, over the last 20 years, 30 years, was patterned after Cartier Panther jewelry because it was such a great motif for the house. But a ring like this, uh, which is probably like five or six, maybe seven carats of, of diamonds, would probably be a, uh, for us to purchase $25,000. So, and, and this, which is also a ring, which was probably original retail around 20,000, we would probably buy for 7,500 just because it's very iconic. With Tiffany and Company, they have obviously different uh, designers. Uh, Schlumberger was the most important designer with Tiffany. Uh, you have Elsa Peretti, you have uh, Picasso, Paloma Picasso, and Frank Gehry, which hasn't met with as much success. But out of all the designers they've ever had, and, and uh, uh, there was also uh, uh, another designer that escapes me, but. Right now, uh, out of all the designers that uh, Tiffany has ever had, Schlumberger is the most important designer. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, the enamel bangles. Well, with some modern jewelry from Tiffany & Company that's made over and over again, that's not necessarily Schlumberger, we can pay somewhere between 20 and 30% of the retail value, which is gonna be more than the scrap value. However, with Schlumberger, we could maybe pay up to 40% if it's modern. But if it's 1960 Schlumberger or 70s Schlumberger, we can pay a lot more than that. It's very subjective. At that time, it's, it's like buying art. So uh, very important that Schlumberger should be separated from the rest of the pack. This is a good story. Um, this is a David Webb cuff that, that I personally bought. We, uh, I had gotten a call from a jeweler out in California who a woman was looking to scrap a number of gold items, but she, she had a feeling that these items were worth more than the scrap value. And sure enough, she sent them to me, and we bought in that lot was this cuff. And I can't imagine that somebody would have the thought to melt this, but she sent it to us, we bought it, and we did very well with it. It's a very iconic piece, 1960s, and uh, the, the lady was happy, and of course, again, we were happy because we bought a nice piece of jewelry, and we paid very well for it. I have another example too. There was a, a lady in uh, Las Vegas who sent in a pair of earrings through our uh, retail partner in Las Vegas. And they were a pair of 18 or 14 carat uh, Victorian gold earrings and they were only gold. Everybody else in that market had offered anywhere between $250 and $300 for these earrings. But I knew when I got them there was something nice about them. It wasn't just that they were gold and that they were Victorian and they were in great shape. They were a, a really important motif from that time period. And uh, I ended up paying $900 for these, and she couldn't believe that I offered $900. She immediately accepted the offer, of course, because she had only gotten $300 locally. And she said, well, I'm going to go back to that jeweler, and I'm going to bring them a 3.26 carat GVS round brilliant stone for you to buy from me. And I said to her, I said, great, just make sure that that retailer, tell them to send it to my attention, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want them to snag that stone. But the reason why she was happy to sell this stone to us is because we were the only company out there that treated her fairly uh, with this particular pair of earrings. And she thought because they were old that they were worth more than they were. And they were. And so it's a good story because you never know. There's nothing ever too small to buy from a client. You never know where it could lead, you know, to the next purchase. And in this case, I ended up buying a 3.26 GVS round brilliant that happened to be triple uh, X as well. 
Okay, so jewelry versus gold. This is Angela Cummings. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Angela Cummings, but she was a very great designer. Um, I just recently bought a cuff like this for $5,000 that was in good shape. And this is clearly uh, Angela Cummings' work, and we can pay a premium for this type, even though it's only gold. It's not, there's nothing more than just the gold, but Angela Cummings has a great name in the industry. Here's a, this is a Castell uh, Castellani piece. This is a very important piece of jewelry. Most of you wouldn't know it. You might have seen something like this before and don't know if it's the genuine article, but this is something that you could pay three or four times the gold value for. It's that rare. It doesn't look like much, but it's something that really could uh, uh, sell for a premium over the gold price. Cartier, of course, uh, three gold ring. It's just gold, but again, we're going to pay a premium over the gold price. A pretty good premium, depending on what it is. The, the Van Cleef line, which is about this big, which if you weighed it for intrinsic value would be probably four or five hundred, but something we would pay three thousand for. And now the genuine article, uh, how to tell the difference between certain pieces from certain time periods. And uh, this on the left hand side is not Art Deco, this is true Art Deco. And the reason is, is a lot of the reason is, and this probably came a little bit after the Art Deco period, is when color was mixed, it wasn't necessarily uh, from the Art Deco period. This is true Art Deco here on the right, and that's uh, uh, probably 1940s. So, can uh, I know there's somebody in the audience who could pick out the genuine article here, but I'm going to ask if anybody could point or say right hand or left hand side for the genuine Art Nouveau uh, piece. Which one is genuine? Right, right. Anybody else? You say left side? Why do you say right side? Same reason? Why did you, she says because of the motif. Well, you're right. It's the one on the right. That they both look like Art Nouveau, but the one on the left is not genuine. All right, so achieving a positive outcome when buying from your clients. Um, the, the one thing, our intellectual property that, w that we covet the most is managing expectations. And that's when, when somebody comes to work for Circa, they train for six months before they're able to sit down with a client and, and buy jewelry. And uh, the reason is, is because uh, our culture is, is that we want to make people feel good about their jewelry, whether we buy it or we don't buy it. It's important for us if somebody comes to us to buy uh, to sell a piece of jewelry that they walk away feeling good whether we buy it or not. Obviously, our goal is to buy it, but if we can't buy it for whatever reason, then uh, we want them to walk away feeling it was a great experience no matter what. So when I'm working with jewelers who are in the purchasing agent program and they send in a piece of jewelry, the worst thing that they could do is say to the client, it could be worth this much and they speculate what they could possibly get. And the reason why that's dangerous is because before I came to Circa, I worked on the retail side for many years. When I came to Circa for a one-day interview, they came out, and I had worked for Graf, and I had sold large stones, and they came out with a 38-carat fancy yellow uh, diamond, a cushion, and asked me, what do you think we would offer for this? And I was like, you know, I know what we would have sold it for at Graf. We would have sold it for 60000 a carat. Or it was a fancy intense yellow, excuse me, 38 carat fancy intense. And I, I guessed. I said, I don't know, 40000 And they were like, no, 20000 a carat. So I had no idea. I'd been in retail forever, but I had no idea what the secondary market was about. No clue whatsoever. So I had to be retrained or trained from scratch exactly uh, when I came to uh, Circa to learn what the the values are in the secondary market. So I never try to speculate. If somebody needs a range, I'll give them a range, but I never want to mislead anybody because it always uh, 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 will end up not in your favor. Professionalism and courtesy or must, selling jewelry can be very emotional. As we know, buying jewelry can be very emotional too. The emotions just change. You know, a lot of times when you, somebody comes in to buy a diamond ring, it's a happy occasion. When they're coming to sell the diamond ring, it's not so happy anymore. <laughs> I can't tell you how many rings that I bought that said, in, you know, inside forever, you know, <laughs> and it was really only, you know, 10 years ago. 
So there's a lot of, you know, and some people will come in and they'll just throw all their cards on the table and tell you exactly, this is ex-boyfriend jewelry and I don't care about this. It's dangerous though for you to think, oh, I got an opportunity here because then you could start making offers that are, oh, she doesn't care about this. I'm gonna make low offers and see if I can get away with this. But people will fool you. People lie, first of all, I'm finding. They lie a lot. Oh, well, this jeweler told me that it's worth 10,000. Well, will they write that check for 10,000? Well, he said he would. Okay, go ask him and see if he'll write that check for 10,000 and then come back. And invariably they come back. Because people hear things doesn't necessarily mean it's tr the truth. But, um, so I have to be very careful. Uh, I did have a girl come in one time into our offices in New York and she had a little, uh, like a, a box like this. Inside the box was a bunch of jewelry she just thrown in together and she dumped it out on the table. And in it was a four and a half carat EVVS emerald cut mounted, just sitting there with all the rest of the jewelry. In some sense, she was giving me a, a signal that she didn't care about this stuff because she threw it all on this thing. But at the end of the day, when I made the offers, she pulled out this sheet of paper and had prices for everything listed of what she wanted. The only one piece that I, that I missed on of what she wanted was a round brilliant that actually I ended up buying and it paying too much for her. So the one piece, but because I was honest about the process and I offered what I thought I should have offered, even though she gave me the signal, I bought everything, it was 128,000. There's no such thing as a small customer. You never know where a scrap rot lot might lead to. And that's case in point was the woman I was talking about in Vegas who sold those little gold earrings and I bought a, a, a really juicy stone from her. Even if you don't buy, leave your customer feeling good about their jewelry, very important. You know, there are people that will look at a piece of jewelry and say, this is a piece of, you know, POS, uh, or I don't have a market for this, or, you know, we never say anything like that. Our company makes offers. We never ask somebody, what do you want for this? You know, we don't, that's not how we operate. It's very important for us, for people to, because there seems to be a little bit of a, a, a stigma attached to the secondary market, we want to try and make it okay and comfortable for people to sell their things in this marketplace. Because if I'm the first person to give an offer to somebody and, they're, and they've never been uh, to sell jewelry before and they're going to be shocked and they might say, oh my God, that's a low offer and, or whatever, I always say that, listen, I'll step back and I'll say, You're not, I'm not telling you to, to take my offer here. I think the best thing for you to do is go out into the marketplace and show it to a few professionals and then come back to me because you're obviously you've never done this before. It's very important for me to make people feel comfortable about this process because if they had gone out and shopped it first they would know that I'm not going to be a shocking offer but the first time somebody goes to sell a piece of jewelry it's kind of shocking. It's like throwing cold water in their face. They don't know what the value. Most people expect half of what they paid. I don't know where that came from, but that's what I hear all the time. I should get half of what I paid, or I should get half of what it's uh, appraised for. Well, who did the appraisal? When was the appraisal done? You know, that was a marquee that was hot 40 years ago. Today it's not hot, you know? So uh, anyway, know when you don't know when to call in an expert. So that's what we're here for. If you guys uh, ever come across something in your, uh, daily, uh, if you ever come across something that comes over the counter you're not sure about, feel free to call us. We'll walk you through. I can't tell you how many jewelers that I work with that call me or email me with pictures of things. What do you think this would be worth? What do you think this would be worth? Let us make the mistakes. I can tell you our culture is, is if we're not making mistakes, we're not buying enough. But some people can't afford to make mistakes and lose money. But it's part of our culture. We really make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. I bought a diamond recently for 42,000 that I got. I sold for 38,000. It's because I saw the color differently than it actually was. I was on the road. It, it just didn't look whiter than I, you know, it was. It was off by a color, and I made that mistake. Uh, and it happens. But and I don't live with it, thank God, because it's part of our culture. And so. Um, so the purchasing agent program, I've talked about a little bit. Reputation of unparalleled customer service, inventory of top jeweler and watch brands. If that's something that you're interested in, we have a, a, a booth over here um, that we can talk to you about. The benefits, obviously we're going to drive traffic into your store through our advertising program. The in-store event, which has been successful wherever we go. Uh, matter of fact, the last three weeks uh, we were in 
Radnor, Pennsylvania with Bernie Robbins. Birmingham, Alabama with Bromberg's and Jacksonville with uh, uh, Underwoods. And we did uh, over a million and a half in three weekends. And our closing ratio was over 80%. It's pretty good. And some people might have come in just to shop us that were the local competition. So maybe it's a higher, you know, a higher closing ratio. When we do buying events, it's a very high closing ratio. What I've also noticed in the last three years, the trend is, um, for the first couple years I've been on the road, a lot of people were selling out of need and out of desperation. And there were a few people selling because they wanted to trade. It was a small percentage, maybe 10% of the people were trading, but most of them were selling and taking the check and running. Over the last six months to a year, I've noticed more trading going on. In other words, people are coming into the stores that we do business with, they're selling their jewelry and they're buying something else with the money that they make from their old jewelry. It's a very important sales tool for people uh, in today's economy when people don't maybe have $5,000 to spend on a piece, but they want it. Maybe they have $3,000 and maybe they can go home and pull their old jewelry out of their box, come in and sell for a couple thousand and have the difference. A lot of our stores across the country who use our program use it for this reason alone, to trade into new merchandise. One of the deals I made in Underwood was uh, three Rolex watches and a gold chain towards the purchase of another Rolex watch for the lady. It was a man who was selling his watches to buy a watch for the lady. No blood. He didn't have to pay a cent out of pocket. We were able to do the, the uh, do the exchange even uh, because the, he had three gold Rolexes and a, a gold chain and it added up to the amount of the new gold Rolex. So it was great for them. They were happy. Annual in-store buying event optional. Circus sponsored local advertising campaign, which we're doing. Uh, we did hold 20 in-store buying events last year. I can tell you we're doing more this year because I'm on the road every weekend. And we're probably going to end up with 30 at least this year. And we're going to start making, this is a pair, actually I bought these earrings. Um, does anybody recognize who would have made an earring like this? Let's just, I'll give you a hint. They were 1980s, a very, uh, uh, they only had one store in the 80s and it was in the Pierre Hotel in New York. It wasn't Marina. It wasn't Marina. No. Does anybody recognize them? No. That's a big hint. There were, okay, I'll give you another hint. They were originally um, a Greek company that moved to Rome in 1904 and became Italian, Bulgari, exactly. They're Bulgari earrings. They're literally this big. I paid like 6,500 for them. The Circa Advantage. Uh, partnering with Circa benefit retailers because we do purchase everything. We provide credibility with the Circa brand name, and we give an option of an arm's length transaction, which I talked about before. I've heard this several times. A woman went to sell a piece of jewelry at a store that she did business with. She sold it for $500. She went back a few days later and saw it in a cage, case for $5,000. She was very upset with the jeweler, and she said she's never going to go back there again. That jeweler lost a client because they put something in their case that they bought that she recognized as hers. I think that's important to kind of move that piece out. Let us be that platform for you. Um, if you have multiple stores in multiple states, maybe that's a different story. But uh, another client who was a half a million dollar a year client with a company, same thing happened. They sold something to the, uh, to the store for, I think, $1,750 found it in their case uh, several weeks or months later for $10,000 and decided they were never going to, they didn't trust the jeweler anymore. So there is a benefit to having a partner to work with you so that you're at arm's length. Arm's length also means that when I make the phone call and they're not happy with the offer that, or you make the phone call to the client and they say, oh, I'm not happy with that offer. You can say, well, listen, this is just a reflection of the marketplace. This is a company that all they do is buy and this is their offer. So you're really at arm's length, because how many times has somebody, have you sold something, somebody came back to you within a year or two years to sell it back to you, and then, and you don't need it anymore, what are you gonna do? You know, a lot of people do accept trades, but towards the purchase of something else, but what if that client comes back to you and says, I don't wanna trade, I wanna sell this back to you, and I want what I paid for it. It happens. So this is a, uh, a kind of a capture of where we are right now. 
And uh, at this point, I'll open it up for questions, if anybody has questions. When you saw that piece of bulgari, you recognized it, right? Correct. Did you tell the, the, the seller? Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, that, that happened to me recently where a woman came to a buying event. Oh, the question was, sorry. The question was, did I, did I explain to the customer when I saw this that these were in fact bulgari? When I found out that it was bulgari, did I say it? Yes, I did. It's part of the disclosure process for us. Um, I was at a buying event once and a woman came in with a number of rings and some jewelry. It was obviously not hers. It was her aunt or somebody else. She had no attachment to it. One of the pieces in it was a Van Cleef ring. I, exp I, I said to her, did you know this was Van Cleef? I didn't think that she did because she didn't really have any uh, knowledge of the jewelry. She goes, I didn't know that. I could have easily have offered without it being Van Cleef, but I felt like in, it's, it's, it's my duty as a professional to explain to her what she has. I ended up paying a lot more for that ring than I could have, but I feel better about the process when, I'm, when I disclose exactly what they have. Very important question. Any other questions? There you go. Okay, if somebody comes in your store and they just have an ordinary, let's say, half a pair of diamond ring, right, is that they have the appraisal? So, what? Like, How do you explain the appraisal well, away? <laughs> It's, it's not formulaic. That's I mean, the. It's, just, yeah, like, it's not formulaic like that because I have paid 10% of an appraisal before and I've also paid full appraisal. It depends on what it is. The, the problem is there's a lot of appraising that goes on that's egregious. It's way too high. You could go out and replace it for less. So it's, for whatever reason, people will go 25% higher than what it would actually cost in the marketplace. That part I have to explain to people all the time. An, an insurance appraisal is for, or excuse me, an appraisal is for a high retail replacement for insurance. If you lose the piece, then, but the racket is the insurance company will go out and replace it at a wholesale market. So people are overpaying for insurance. You know, the insurance companies love it, but it's easy to explain away, for me at least, or for us at least, because it's not a reflection, it's a retail replacement. It's not a reflection of the secondary market or the estate market. They're two different markets. There's no correlation between the two. But a lot of people will go out and they'll get their pieces appraised before they go and sell it. And that's a mistake because they're always going to come in with these high expectations. They, they think they should, they should get half of what it is. But there's so many variables you have to take into consideration that appraisers don't take into consideration, which is demand. What kind of demand is there for this piece today? Does the demand warrant the appraisal being so high? If the demand doesn't warrant it, then the appraisal is a little too high. So it's easy, and it's just an opinion. An appraisal is an opinion. But if you took a piece of jewelry to sell it to five different professionals who are in the buying business, you're gonna get within five or 10% of the same offer. Yeah, it's, you know what, that's, it, you bring up a good point because we do ask. It's all about information. You can't, I, if I don't have the information, I can't make the purchase. If I do make an offer of $10,000 on something and somebody says no, I will say to them, well, let me ask you, what were you hoping to achieve here? I was hoping to achieve 12000 And if they're close enough, then I can, we can talk about a potential second option, which is to show it to collectors and things of the sort. There's always a way to help somebody beyond just the original offer. At Circa, our philosophy is to not negotiate. We don't want to negotiate uh, because what would our first offer be? It's just an arbitrary number that doesn't mean anything. So we st stand. But if somebody says I'm looking for twenty thousand and I've offered ten thousand, I might ask them, "How did you come up with that number?" Just out of curiosity, where did you get that number? And they'll say, "Well, my insurance appraisal was for forty, so I'm thinking it's worth twenty. Or they'll say, uh, "Joe Schmo Jeweler told me that it's worth twenty, and don't take a penny less." 
and that's when it's a very hard defense because then you have to convince them that their jeweler who they've known forever is not right. If he's willing to write the check for 20, let him write the check. But if he's not, what he's telling you is not the reality. Correct. Because the reality is it's not the right reality. Well, that's what I say. As a professional, I would recommend that you take that offer because I can't come anywhere near that. And good luck. You know, <laughs> run. <laughs> run. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right back here. I came in late, so I hope I didn't miss my answer to this question. I just wondered if there's a website or some kind of education, something that you can tell people to go to. That it, so you're not the first one giving them the really bad news. Like, just, you know, some, I just feel like there needs to be something that gives them a little, you know, I would just love to be able to say to my customers, um, spend some, you know, spend some time on this website. Yeah. Is there anything in existence? I don't think there is an educational website on how to sell your jewelry. It's a good point, you know. Uh, I do know that when people Google how to sell your jewelry, they do find uh, sites like ours. And we consider ourselves consumer advocates if somebody calls us. We really want to teach somebody about, we want to help navigate the, the, the waters in the secondary market. We do consider ourselves consumer advocates. Education is very important on the secondary market because nobody has it. And if you've never sold something before, you're going to be shocked when you walk into the market. And some people are not going to be on the level and they're going to offer you less. It's always always best to get more than one opinion. So, but you're right. I don't think there's anything that really truly exists on the internet. But when they do, when if you go now, if you go and uh, after today, go on Google how to sell jewelry or sell jewelry, you'll see our website comes up, one of the first websites. And it's very comprehensive too, about our process. So. No, absolutely not. eBay is like a, a retail website for the secondary market. So, uh, and anybody can ask anything they want on eBay. Whether they're getting it's another story. The only way you know is if you can see the closed auctions. Um, but Craigslist is a problem because people get robbed. It's where do you go to where do you go to show the piece of jewelry to the person who's interested in it? And and there's been more and more instances of that. You know why? as jewelers, why do we have doors, doormen and clickers because of security reasons? And so uh, it's easy for somebody to set up an appointment to see somebody uh, you know, at a bank vault and, and, and literally get robbed. So it's not a good, I don't think that's a good uh, reference point. And in eBay is neither because most people who come to me and say, well on eBay I saw it for X amount of dollars. Well on eBay that's a retail price for the secondary market and let, they can ask it for as long as they want, but see if it gets sold. You can, you can pay like $10 a month to find out what the, li the closed listings are, to find out, and, and you'll find out, like uh, if somebody comes to me and, and they have a, a half a carat princess cut diamond ring and they say they're gonna put it on eBay, I say great, go put it on eBay. As soon as you put it in the search engine, you're gonna see 17,000 matches for this ring. And most people aren't going to buy a ring on eBay without a GIA certificate or from a well-known source. So it's easy to explain that away too, because it, it could just sit there, and you're paying fees, and you're not, and it's not selling. And then you have a 10%. Uh, e, you know, the fee is about 10% for PayPal and uh, and for your seller's fees. The listing fees are cheap now, but the seller's fees and the, and the PayPal fees, is what's going to get you? So, and then you could ship it, and then they could say they never got. It. I mean, there's a lot of. Uh,
put it on eBay if you don't have any good response and then you come back and this is what And a lot of times people come back. Right. Because we've been nice enough and helpful enough to tell them what a realistic offer within the trade person person would be. But then if it doesn't sell, then they know where the store will help them out. So they come back and sell out. Obviously, a consumer is going to get more if they could sell it to the end user, but consumers don't have access to the end user. We do. The trade does. So at some point, it has to go through the trade. Some people are savvy enough that they could go on eBay and sell it themselves, and they get top dollar for it. But for the most part, uh, most people cannot. Uh, no. Yes, sir. Of course, yeah. I mean, we. That's it, a good. It, with Rolex, it's a good point because, like, a 1985 Rolex Ladies Datejust is like a 1985 Mercedes C Class. It's worth something, but it's not worth what a night. You know, what a 2012 Mercedes is worth. Same as a, a 2012 Ladies Datejust. That's perfect. And so, obviously, like some cars are rare from some time period. So are some watches. Uh, 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 a we just bought. A, I just bought a Rolex uh, Daytona 1960s, not Daytona, but the Cosmograph, which is worth twenty something thousand dollars today. Uh, a car from that time period that's a classic will be worth more than most cars from that time period. There are certain things that will stand out, but for the most part, it's uh, uh, and it's all again. It's about good example Cartier Santos steel and gold 1978 came out was the best-selling watch in the 80s they're everywhere they're only worth what somebody's willing to pay because they're available if it's not as available from that time period then it's worth more so it's all about availability you know at that one time that watch was the hottest watch everybody had to have it. they paid a premium now it's worth less than a thousand dollars so any other questions yes sir You don't have to follow that protocol if you send to us in New York. Basically how it works, if, if you own a piece of jewelry that you've bought over the counter and the 30 days is clear and you want to sell it to me, you can sell it to me immediately if, I, if we agree on a price, let's say, and you invoice me. If it's a client's uh, piece of jewelry and you send it to me and I make the offer to you, net dollars offer, let's say, and you pull 10% out and you give the offer to your client and they accept, we'll send a check to you. You invoice us and we send it right away. You don't have to hold. We only do that in our market, uh, Washington, D.C., we have to hold for 30 days. In other markets, you do. But if we're buying through New York, it's New York State or New York uh, City laws apply. So you don't have to hold for 30 days. And that's speculative when you're buying certain things, you know, uh, especially gold, because the market could go like this in 30 days. I mean, luckily for you, it's been like this, so you, you've been doing well. But it, you can circumvent the 30 days by selling direct to us in New York, yes. Yes, sir. Part of the answer is, is uh, I'm not certain about your statement in Colorado on the 30 day hold that it's on the premises of the state of New York. We have a lawsuit shipped to the United States to sell direct from the other two. Correct. Right. Yeah, if you buy it over the counter, you have to hold it for 30 days no matter what. But if you don't buy it, you send it to me for me to buy it, then you don't have to wait 30 days. It's that simple. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So basically, if, if we were to send something to you to evaluate to make an offer for the our customer um, and they turn it down, then you just send the item right back? Send the right item right back at our expense. Overnight, three days. Well, generally speaking, when somebody sends something to us, we'll call you the day that it's received and let you know that it's been received okay. Then I would call you within that day or the next day with the offer to purchase. If we don't come to terms, it comes back to you within one to two days. So it's a pretty efficient so process. Within less than a week, yeah. Unless it falls over a weekend. Right, and that's something that customers, a lot of times, especially with the very high-end piece, they'll be very leery of, A, leaving it, they don't want it out of their sight. Um, what are some objections to, or overcoming the objections of that? 
Well, that, that's a good point too because some people don't want to leave it because it might be their only tangible asset. Um, if you ask them to, if you, if they're not, if you're not willing to make an offer to them that they're willing to accept, and maybe we can give you strength. And if you want to expose that you have a partnership with Circa, that's great. What I will tell you, if you send somebody to us or send a piece of jewelry to us for an offer and we send two checks, one for you and one for the client, we'll always protect our relationship with you. Because some people then think, well, I should just circumvent the store and go straight to Circa. What will stop me from doing that? But I, we, we know where everybody comes from. When we sit down with somebody, we ask them, how did you hear of us? If it's a name that, that we've done business before and it was through your store, we would make sure that you got a, a, a check if they came to us and didn't tell you. That happens a lot. People get checks all the time. I, I don't know how many commission checks I'm signing all the time because somebody came in, they heard about us through this store, through that store, or through this store. We always protect your, uh, our relationship. But uh, more importantly, how to overcome the objective of sending it away if you tell people that it's fully insured and we can insure it for, and you, if they say, well, let's say the piece is worth 5,000, you've offered four, they want five. I give you 5,000, but if you insure it for 20,000, and it gets lost, you know, sometimes they laugh and that's enough for them to think, you're, you're right, it's okay. You can also say, look, I'm gonna send it to a company that we work with, go online and look at their uh, website and, look, and look, read all about them. And that helps too, because we're adding value to your, we're adding value, because we're a brand as well, so. Not an offer, because that would be irresponsible of me, of me, but I would make a range of where I would pay. Because if I was to say I would pay 10000 for that piece without seeing it, and I get it, and I don't, I don't believe in the mark or whatever it is, but I would never, because I think that's not responsible to make an offer without seeing the piece. But I will give you a range, absolutely. Anything else? Well, thank you. Appreciate it.